Hi, I'm Kayla Sosa, and today I'm interviewing my grandmother, Ruth Tucker. She's the author of over 20 books, her most recent being Fired at 57, My Fight for Justice in Christian Academia. She's going to talk about a specific startling part about slut shaming, but first let's have a sentence or two of background on the book. In 2000, I was hired as the first full-time woman professor in a 125 year history of the school. In 2003, January, I was without warning removed from tenure track and given a terminal appointment. Wow, so the first woman ever in 125 years. So what was their reasoning for that? I was told by the Dean that my student and faculty evaluations were so bad that he just had no other choice than to let me go. I, I couldn't believe it because I knew about student evaluations, but he had proof with faculty. I mean, he was quoting them and just one terrible quote after another. Well, it turned out actually that it was another administrator that had made all these quotes that he uh, was, was quoting to me. But I was just so devastated and I asked him, why didn't you warn me? And he said, you know, I didn't realize myself that you were so bad. So basically they told you that you were too incompetent to teach. Yeah, that, that I was, I just didn't have the skills, the ability to teach at the seminary and it just sent me reeling. Uh, I, you know, I, I was frustrated. I was very depressed when he emphasized that. Mm -hmm. I can imagine shock, depressed, but knowing you, you were probably furious. You know, you'd think so, but I, the emotion that just overwhelmed me was humiliation. Mm -hmm. In fact, I asked him at the end, does anyone have to know about this? I was thinking about other people finding out and they would find out that I was so bad that I could not teach at Calvin Seminary. So it was a terrible feeling and uh, I didn't know how I would get over it, but uh, it was final. Mm -hmm. He had no other choice. Okay, so back to the beginning. How does slut shaming fit into all of this? Well, my colleagues initially had supported me because they knew I was a good teacher. And they knew that their evaluation certainly wouldn't have been so bad at all. And so they were jumping in and demanding what really was the problem. They wanted facts. They wanted to see the evaluations of their fellow faculty members. They wanted to see student evaluations. And it was only then that they came up with this idea that it was ungodly conduct. And ungodly conduct is nothing short of slut shaming. Mm. Well, maybe they just meant you weren't spiritual or that you had said something bad in their eyes. That wasn't it at all. It was, it was truly slut shaming. In fact, I have a little section on this in the book on page 40. Um, I have a, a subtitle, Slut Shaming, but then I go down and I say the Christian Reformed Church definition of ungodly conduct. And the seminary is part of the Christian Reformed Church. And right in their manual, they talk about uh, ungodly conduct. They don't say slut shaming, but they talk about ungodly conduct, such things as committing adultery, voyeurism, hosting a porno site. Actually, the former president asked me if I was on the internet, if it could have been, he'd heard it was ungodly conduct. And he wondered if it was something I was doing on the internet, uh, prostitution, if I were being a prostitute, that would have qualified sexual intimidation. So my colleagues just abandoned me. They were not, you know, they, they were not a gossipy group. And it wasn't like they wanted to know what the ungodly conduct was. It was just like, you know, I don't want to have any part of this. If it's ungodly conduct and she's done something bad, we trust you guys. So if they wanted to fire you for ungodly conduct, why didn't they just say that to begin with when they first terminated you? Well, that's a good question. Why didn't they? Why didn't they come up with that to begin with? But there was nothing about it from the beginning. And they just made that up. They knew exactly what ungodly conduct meant. And they made that up because they knew my colleagues 
would abandon me, that they're not going to support me, and was unspecified, ungodly conduct, so confidential that nobody could know, not even me. Wow. So did the administrators ever admit to lying about the ungodly conduct? Oh, of course not. Not at all. But uh, eventually I was able to get outside independent mediation and I asked the mediators to find out that the president had to say what the ungodly conduct was. I wanted it in writing. And that's when he came up with this idea of hysteria. And then I went on for 35 minutes of incoherent rage. Now, whatever that is, you know, if that had been true, why wouldn't he fired me on the spot? Why wouldn't he have sent me a memo and say, we just can't tolerate that much hysteria from you. Why wouldn't these two men that supposedly were in the room left the room and said, we're not going to sit here for 10 minutes even. I mean, that's really pathetic that they would stay around for 35 minutes listening to me rage. Mm -hmm. So what did the independent mediators have to say about your situation? You know, they kind of saw through it. And this ungodly conduct, when they found out he was accusing me of incoherent rage for 35 minutes, that just doesn't make sense. And they said, among other things, that I should get retroactive pay, that I should be appointed a full professor, and that the charges of ungodly conduct were inflammatory and should be taken out of the record. So they knew exactly what was up, and it went down in my favor, but in the end, they had sent a fax, and the president of the board who was in charge of it said the fax was smudged, and therefore we could not use that independent mediator's report that went on for six weeks. And actually, the president of the board, who was a rich oil man, uh, paid for it, but it was like they just flushed it down the toilet and paid no attention to it. Do you think they would have done that had the mediators come down on the side of the administrators? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So how do you feel now about all of this? You know, I look back and There's a certain amount of anger. You know, I I have a quote here that uh, from Frederick Beatner. I talk about him, and he lost his father when he when Beatner was ten years old. His father committed suicide, and he writes about that in the book. And he said he writes this: "I hear the self pity in that his telling about that, but I do not apologize for it." I pity the child who happens to be me the way I would pity any child in such circumstances. And I write, I pick up on that, and I said, I too have distance in looking back. I pity the confident woman who was brought so low on that dark, late January afternoon in Henry's office. I pity her as I would pity any woman who was so terribly humiliated that her last best option was to give a groveling question, does anyone have to know? I hardly know that woman, but I pity her. She's a different woman than I am today. So you pity that version of yourself back then, but what about today? Oh, I think I'm happier than I have ever been. In fact, I'm not even sure I would have married John Worse, longtime music professor at Calvin College, had this not happened to me. Now, that's a different story, so we're not going to go into that today. But my life has been so good, and I felt a sense of freedom being um, away from the school and uh, not having to fight every day for my reputation for justice. Mm -hmm. So this whole story is in Fired at 57. It is, and a lot more. And it's an interesting book, if I say so myself. (laughs) Actually, let me me just read the um, the, uh, table of contents. Chapter one, does anyone have to know shame and self-doubt, the smoking gun, an academic dean's dishonest evaluation. That's a good chapter. Gender gender tenured, sex discrimination in plain sight, slandered and sidelined, 
renewal for ungodly conduct. Actually, they, I, they didn't just accuse me of ungodly conduct. They sent me into renewal, and that was a horrible. I need to do a, 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 an interview on that. That was such a horrible <laughs> ordeal. Chapter 5, Hot Flashes and Hardball. <laughs> Gender difference is disregarded. I had industrial strength hardball, and I tell about that in the book. Yeah. And in that chapter too, I also talk about there's no crying in baseball. That comes from a movie. And I cried on one occasion, and I got written up for crying. There's no crying at the seminary. Mm -hmm. Surveillance and psychological testing, more than paranoia. They sent me to a psychologist hoping that they would get some real dirt on me. The thing is, she, she wrote me up so well. I couldn't believe it when I read that. I thought, that doesn't <laughs> sound like me. But she was apparently impressed with me. I, I, I must have fooled her or something. Um, academic mobbing, colleagues joining the posse. My colleagues said, just come back to the faculty room. Come on, join in. Get over yourself, get over it. That's not that easy. When I knew that there was so much surveillance of me and anything I had said in the faculty room would have been used against me. So I call that academic mobbing, which books have been written on that topic. Um, Chapter 8, A Mother's Day Letter, and this is about the President's letter to me on Mother's, well, it was a weekend of Mother's Day, mm -hmm. Unbridled Anger Leading to Mediation. And that's how I got outside independent mediation, and um, that's where it came out that I, I write Chapter 9, Hysterical Woman. 35 minutes of incoherent rage. And that's when uh, he was claiming that was the ungodly conduct. And finally, a fired up aftermath, going public and celebrating freedom. And that was going public with my blog and being free from the school and feeling so good. That's the best chapter, I think, mm -hmm. in the book. Yeah, really rounds it out on a positive note. It does. And the book also includes a lot of stories of others who have gone through this. And that's part of the reason uh, for the book. In fact, I write um, in the uh, preface, I want to just read that because it's uh, from Anne Lamott as to, to why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for others, to help others as much as anything else, and to get a sense. In fact, I was surprised when I was researching. I had forgotten so much, and I was shocked often. Did this really happen? I could hardly believe it. Mm -hmm. But Anne Lamott, in her book Bird by Bird, writes, we write to expose the unexposed. If there is one door in the castle you have been told not to go through, you must. The writer's job is to turn the unspeakable into words. Not just any words, but if we can, into rhythm and blues. Actually, the book does have a lot of rhythm and blues. You can find the book for $6.99 on Amazon and half that price on Kindle. Check it out.